Well, I want to welcome everyone to this session on COVID-19 randomized clinical trial design and applications of Bayesian sequential design. Um, I'm hoping everyone can hear and see okay. Um, we had about 300 more people sign up for this than I thought that we would have. So um, I'm going to struggle to manage this the best that I can because I want to give people a chance to ask questions and make comments. Um, I've unmuted everyone and just uh, unmute yourself if you want to speak and, or try using the hand raise um, uh, option on Zoom in the participants uh, uh, window. Uh, so I very much thank you for being here. This is intended to be a very informal discussion. And uh, just to introduce myself a little bit, I'm uh, quarter time with uh, FDA uh, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research Office of Biostatistics in my role as an expert statistical advisor and three quarters of, three quarters of my time with Vanderbilt University uh, School of Medicine. And this talk is really in that capacity. And this is under the auspices of our CTSA program from NCATS, which is part of NIH, uh, our, our institute at Vanderbilt for clinical and translational sciences is called the Vanderbilt Institute for Clinical and Translational Science. And this is part of the Trial Innovation Network and uh, uh, Trial Innovation Center uh, program that's affiliated with CTSA. Um, so this web page that I hope you've all had a chance to look at has a lot of resources on it. Um, and we're going to be going through some of those resources. And I wanted to give you an overview of, of what we're going to be covering uh, that's listed here on the uh, bullet points of the web page. Um, so we're mainly talking about this fully sequential design and analysis plan. Uh, there's a lot of associated issues. And one of the main points that I wanted to bring up is kind of obvious that uh, there's a lot of advantages to Bayesian thinking and Bayesian clinical trial design and analysis. And those advantages are not new, but I think they've been underappreciated. And in an era of uh, a pandemic where uh, research develop and development is taking place at a, pa a pace that's really unheard of, it just makes the call for Bayesian methods be more, uh, more loud. And I think the advantages of Bayes uh, get to be more pronounced when you're trying to learn rapidly. We don't have a cycle where you develop a clinical trial and a year later it's approved and you finished writing the stat plan and protocol. Things are happening now within days. Um, and then uh, when we're designing, when we're executing the trial, uh, other treatments are becoming available. Other treatments are, are showing themselves not to work. And trials are having to make changes as they go. Uh, there's a very general theme that uh, those of you who have ever seen me on Twitter know that uh, I'm not a big fan of sample size and power calculation. And I, I really have called sample size calculation uh, voodoo. And it's really based on wishful thinking and a lack of knowledge. And I, I think it's really held back uh, science to a great degree. Um, and I would rather think of the sample size as being a random variable and just admit that we don't know what the sample size should be. So Bayes really allows you to do that in a very cogent way. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about that. But just to go over some of the things we're, we're going to be discussing, there's a lot of issues um, and there's a link here to a discussion uh, captured uh, where uh, several of us have been talking about the statistical models needed to analyze data for COVID-19. There's some very special needs, and this takes as much work or more work than the actual uh, Bayesian design. And I want to mention my uh, collaborator, uh, Chris Lenzel at Vanderbilt, and also Jonathan Schilkraut, uh, and we work uh, very heavily with uh, David Schoenfeld at Mass General, um, and also with Ben Goodrich at Columbia in, in talking through the design and working up analysis solutions. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, there's some documents that give a lot of general uh, resources about uh, Bayes. And even though I'm part-time with FDA, I do want to mention that none of this is uh, sanctioned or approved or recommended by FDA in any way. 
Um, and so there's a, a talk that I just gave about fundamental advantages of Bayes you can look at. And then we're having a lot of model development software because I found that we need to handle uh, Bayesian uh, ordinal models uh, and especially with longitudinal ordinal data. There's kind of a gap in that world. So you'll see links related to that. There's a discussion board. Uh, what I wanted to, oh, and, and down here are some other topics that are related. And I've spent a lot of time developing, uh, you can click here to get these uh, hundreds of pages of course notes. This course called Biostatistics and Biomedical Research has a lot of sections that are related to what we're talking about, uh, especially about ordinal outcomes and clinical trials. You can look at those sections in, in the course notes, proportional odds model, uh, power calculations with a proportional odds model, uh, basic Bayesian approaches, which will give you a good introduction to Bayes if you haven't been introduced yet, uh, how to deal with differential treatment effect uh, and avoid subgroup analysis, covert adjustment, uh, branches of statistics, and so on. And then I have several blog articles uh, that go into uh, several of the issues in detail. So I wanted to start with one of the blog articles, which is the, uh, the one on continuous learning. And this is really where Bayes shines, I think. And so the idea is that uh, you want to learn quickly and rapidly and, and try to minimize mistakes while you're doing that. And um, Bayes is a sort of a game changer in that. And that's because of the probabilities that Bayes uses versus the probabilities that are used in uh, frequentist uh, statistics. And so there's this famous quote by uh, Edwards, Lindman, and Savage, it's entirely appropriate to collect data until a point has been proven or disproven or until the data collector runs out of time, money, or patience. So that's really kind of the Bayesian approach and really the, the likelihood approach um, and using the likelihood principle. And uh, one of the most difficult uh, uh, challenges that we face is working with people not exposed to Bayesian methods and not exposed to the likelihood school of inference very much. And they really are thinking differently. And um, if you're exposed to all the different schools of thought, I think it helps you think more clearly about all three schools of thought. Um, the biggest problem that I've had is uh, trying to get people to quit hybridizing Bayesian and frequentist methods. They wanna have a Bayesian approach and then they want to have some sort of type one error control. And if you look at how they're calculating type one error, they've made some arbitrary decisions and it's not even calculated in a way that's totally defensible uh, because type one error involves intentions to analyze data and not just actually analysis of data. And there's this wish that we should uh, apply modern methods, including Bayesian adaptive randomized trials, but then show that they preserve the so-called type one error. And that's when you start losing the advantages of Bayes and you, you really come up against a fundamental argument uh, because a lot of clinicians have come to believe and a lot of statisticians that type one error is something that should actually be preserved. And it started off on the wrong foot when we started using the word error, when we say type one error, because it's not the probability of making an error, it's the probability of making an assertion about an effect. And those are very, very different concepts. And when you're using Bayesian methods, you're talking about a more predictive mode. And so this little story, I think really is a good analogy to what's the difference between Bayes and frequentist um, and, and also you can talk about Bayes and the likelihood school uh, so, sort of at the same time. Um, why is it okay to look at the data multiple times in Bayes, whereas in the frequentist world, you have to have a penalty for that. The penalty makes the analysis conservative and it makes it slower to learn. And there's two big ramifications of that. And one is, um, if you get to the end of the study and you've almost got something really interesting, but you have planned to end the study, you usually just end it. And Bayes would say, well, why stop there? And the other thing is you can stop earlier with Bayes for futility. And that's 
actually one of the bigger payoffs for Bayes is, is stopping a futile study earlier. But uh, why is it that you get to keep looking? Well, imagine this um, problem, which is a sort of pattern recognition problem that you're trying to recognize an em enemy uh, a weapon of some sort. Let's say it's a tank and you have a, an image analysis that gives you a probability of the object being a tank. You're looking at it from a distance in some sort of military situation and the object moves closer and the fog, some of the fog clears and now your probability is 0.9. Well, the 0.9 has superseded the 0.8 and it's this succession of time and superseding old information with new information is what really distinguishes Bayes. So, what would be the frequentist analogy in this situation? Of all the times a tested object was not a tank, what's the probability of acquiring a tank-like image characteristic at some point? And it stands to reason that if you acquired lots of images uh, of the distant object, uh, you're gonna acquire more images that have tank-like uh, characteristics in your image analysis. So uh, these, these acquisitions of images of the supposed tank, that is your, those are your data looks in your clinical trial as you go on forward as the trial proceeds. The frequency of the image acquisition and the image sampling design alters the probability of finding a tank-like image. Uh, but then you start to realize that if I am looking at this from a sampling standpoint, and raising the bar, raising the chance of acquiring a tank-like image just because I take images more frequently, that's really divorced from the problem solving uh, that you need to do prospectively. So you have real-time decision to be made and that's made on the basis of cumulative data. And so an earlier tank image is of no interest whatsoever once you obtain a later clearer image that supersedes uh, the first image. So the analogy there is in a clinical trial when there's no treatment effect, the probability of having extreme data will grow with the number of looks and that affects your type one assertion of probability, but it doesn't affect the true chance that the treatment works. So we have multiplicity issues in traditional statistics and I like to call it sampling multiplicity. Uh, the multiplicity comes from the sampling and the frequency of data looks. So this, um, this blog article really goes through simulations to try to bring these points home. And you don't really need simulations to do this because it's all in the basic math of probability. Uh, but if you do the simulations, you'll actually, and you look at the code, you'll actually learn exactly what Bayes is doing. So in this simulation, we're gonna do a one sample problem. Uh, we're just gonna look at a, at a single mean and if the mean is, is bigger than zero, we'll say that's efficacy and less than zero, it's treatments working in the wrong direction. We have some sort of prior distribution. This one's a mixture of two normal distributions. So it's heavily favoring no efficacy at all. And then we have these sequential uh, simulations. And so the way this is done, and I do encourage you to look at the code, even if you can't read our code, I think the code is still really explains the workflow of Bayesian thinking and Bayesian simulation. So with the Bayesian simulation, you don't simulate a, a clinical trial over and over where there's no effect, but you might run 50,000 different clinical trials as I did in this case. And for each of those clinical trials, you'll have some unknown efficacy and you might draw that from a prior distribution. And then you generate data under that truth. It's an unknown truth, unknown efficacy. And so uh, by the way I've done it here, half of the trials have zero or negative efficacy and half have it moving in the right direction. And we're gonna do an analysis after every single subject is accrued. And then we're gonna be super aggressive in doing a sequential study. So stop the study when you're 0.95 sure of efficacy, in other words, treatment effect in the right direction. And we're gonna stop the instant that the posterior probability that the unknown efficacy is positive exceeds 0.95. I'm just making up some, some typical sort of thresholds. We're also gonna stop instantly for futility if the probability that the drug is working in the wrong direction or it just has a trivial 0.05 uh, improvement, 
um, if that's greater than 0.9. So we can use different probabilities for different stopping purposes. So out of the 50,000 trials, 20,000 were stopped early for efficacy, 28,000 were stopped early for futility. Uh, 1,100 trials went to completion, mean, means 500 subjects. The average posterior probability of efficacy at the time of stopping for efficacy was 0.961. Of all the trials that stopped early for efficacy, the proportion that actually had efficacy was 0.960. Um, so you see that no matter how often you calculate the posterior probabilities, how, how aggressive you are in stopping, these, these are really estimating the same number. Um, you have 0.961 because, or 0.96 because you have to overshoot by one person sometimes. Uh, so no matter how aggressive you are, the posterior probabilities keep their originally intended meaning. Likewise, uh, the average posterior probability of futility at the moment you stop for futility was 0.92, and of all the stop, trials stopped early for futility, the proportion in which the underlying data generating mechanism was truly futile uh, in this sense was, was the same. So these are estimating the same number. And so you see that um, really what you need to think about in Bayes is are your posterior probabilities well calibrated? And of course, the main, the main way to make them not calibrated would be that you have, um, you've gone to a lot of work to specify the prior, everybody in the committee has signed off on it. And now somebody comes along who, who wasn't involved in the discussion and they, they have a lot of power and they use a prior that's at odds with what everyone else agreed upon they will call your posterior probabilities miscalibrated. Uh, now, in the case where uh, you don't stop early and you want to take your posterior probability after the 500th patient, you can just do a regular calibration plot just like we do with risk models. It's, it's using the exact same technology to see if our posterior probabilities are well calibrated and you see that they are. So this is really math, but by actually making up simulations, you can show the points a little bit better. Uh, one other side benefit of Bayes is that you know, and this has been well studied, that when you um, stop a study early for efficacy in using a frequentist design, uh, you're going to overstate the amount of efficacy. And there is a very complex adjustment for that, that of all the studies I've ever read uh, that were published in medical journals that stopped early for efficacy, I've never seen one of them actually give the correct adjustment uh, for the efficacy point estimate. Whereas for Bayes, uh, you can see that even though your sample mean uh, is going to be miscalibrated if you stop early for efficacy, your posterior mean is going to be perfectly calibrated if you don't have a prior conflict. So your posterior mean as well as your posterior median for your point estimate are going to be pulled back if you stop early. They're, they're pulled back by the prior. Uh, and then as the study gets to its planned completion closer to 500 patients, uh, that, that effect of pullback from the prior vanishes and you don't need any, any adjustment. You see all of this is automatic uh, with the Bayes, Bayes approach. So that leads us into the, um, the main thing, uh, which is our, um, our design for COVID-19. And this is where we'll also talk a little bit more about endpoints. And there's some background information uh, that you can go to. And also uh, that points you to the um, material I developed as part of my work for FDA, which has a tremendous amount of background information. And you can see here a lot of information about priors and uh, evidence, p-values, confidence intervals, and what's the deal with those, and uh, types of errors, um, how to deal with sample size calculations with Bayes, uh, some examples with multiple endpoints, and there's a lot of resources here that you can click on uh, when you go to this big document, so a lot of things are there. Uh, but, but if we go to our, uh, our main thing here, um, we are um, trying to use continuous learning by just being as aggressive as necessary with frequent data looks. And 
what we're trying to gain evidence about is uh, probability of a beneficial effect of any magnitude, probability of a clinically relevant effect, probability of harm, or probability of similarity. And you could think of a lot of different uh, ways to say these things, but these are just commonly need, common needs that we have in evidence assessment and in uh, clinical trials. Um, and then we're using the look ahead probabilities, which because the later probabilities merely supersede the earlier probabilities, there's no multiplicity uh, need. And Bayes would not even have a way to do a multiplicity adjustment if you, even if you wanted to. So um, this is that tank example again. And then um, using Bayesian posterior probabilities for decision making, um, you know, there's a lot of trade-offs with different sorts of endpoints and efficacy versus safety. A lot more you could talk about and that long handout I just put up a minute ago goes into a lot of that. But these are the, these are the sort of assessments that we can do really easily with Bayes. Um, you really can think of this as a single graph where you have, uh, say, an odds ratio cutoff and the probability of, of having a treatment effect that, that good or better. Um, and um, now the odds ratio greater than one, the way we're using an outcome scale is indicating benefits, not the way we usually write it, it's usually less than one. Uh, but you can show a graph showing the, the chances of all possible amounts of efficacy, or you could just pick off some selected points. So what's the probability of any benefit given the data and given the prior and the model? Uh, those go without saying. Uh, what's the probability of more than trivial benefit? What's the probability of moderate benefit or greater? What's the probability of inefficacy or harm? What's the probability of more than trivial harm? Uh, what is the probability of non-inferiority if you had a mar multiplicative non-inferiority margin of 1.1? Uh, what's the probability of similarity? Odds ratio being between four fifths and five fourths. So whatever you decide is clinically meaningful to try to get evidence for, you can do that with Bayes uh, very easily. And this really addresses a point that's created a lot of controversy. And this is a fundamental problem with the review process at the New England Journal of Medicine because they're continually making this error of allowing authors to conclude that a drug doesn't work when the p-value is greater than 0.05. So I think everyone on the call knows about the absence of evidence. It's not an evidence of absence problem, but you wouldn't know that from New England Journal of Medicine. So uh, there's a discussion about this paper that concluded a treatment wasn't worthwhile. And a lot of people think that treatment was dismissed uh, prematurely. And so with Bayes, you really don't have the ability to make that mistake, or it's much harder to make that mistake. Because if you were to take this trial and calculate this probability, you would find out that this probability is like a coin toss. It's like a 0.5. We have no idea if those true two treatments are similar to each other. And so you wouldn't know that from the way the abstract of the trial was written. Uh, but Bayes will tell you that you just don't have evidence uh, for saying that, that the treatments are similar. Now, then you might come up with some action triggers uh, and you might suggest these to the DSMB or t and tell them they're only suggestions, but they may be useful discussion points. So you might stop with evidence for efficacy if P1, which is P1 was listed uh, up here, if P1 is greater than 0.95, stop with evidence of moderate or greater efficacy if, if it's greater than 0.8. So to claim really big efficacy, you might not require quite as big a posterior probability. Uh, you don't require a 0.95 if you want to st uh, stop with evidence for inefficacy uh, or if you want to stop with evidence for harm. We don't usually require that harm uh, we have a tremendous amount of evidence for harm. So those are just suggestions for how you might uh, might execute the monitoring of a trial. And of course, there's lots of uh, ways to do this. Now for uh, COVID-19 trials, there is a established uh, ordinal outcome from our World Health Organization and there's variations on it. 
uh, how are we going to do a Bayesian uh, sample size calculation? Well, it's usually a little bit computationally complex, requires a fair amount of simulation, but you can take an easy way out of um, using frequentist methods and picking a defensible odds ratio that you would not like to miss. So in this case, uh, we were choosing an odds ratio of 1.75, and that means you needed 438 patients. Um, now, I think of this as an approximation, and I would call this the estimate of the expected sample size. So with Bayes, you can extend a study with no penalty whatsoever. Um, and the way to know that Bayes uh, needs no penalty for that is that uh, it might backfire on you. It's not a guaranteed outcome. So you might have a posterior probability of 0.93. You add 40 more patients and it goes to 0.89. So you're not guaranteed a result, but it might go up and you might have the evidence you need. Uh, so we think of this as an expected sample size. Uh, the, the actual trial uh, may stop earlier than that or might need to be extended. Uh, and there's a little bit more discussion about that here. Um, and then um, this is just looking at the power for different odds ratios. Now this is in the context of the proportional odds model without covariate adjustment. And uh, some of you may know that that is a generalization of the Wilcoxon test. So we love the Wilcoxon test. And if you love the Wilcoxon test, you have to love the proportional odds model, which is its generalization and it allows covariate adjustment. So what is the outcome scale that's being used in a lot of uh, COVID-19 studies is a seven level World Health Organization scale, a uh, study that we're getting off the ground now for uh, hydroxychloroquine is focusing on a day 15, but collecting data on more days to allow longitudinal analysis. So this is the seven level scale. So death is considered the worst outcome. Hospital with invasive mechanical in uh, ventilation is the next worst on a given day. Uh, high flow oxygen, uh, supplemental oxygen, hospital, uh, hospitalized, not on supplemental oxygen, not hospitalized, unable to resume normal activities, or you're at home, you're in good shape. That's the seven levels. And there's uh, extensions of this, I believe, up to 11 levels. And when you're doing ordinal analysis, the more levels you have, the better. You'll just increase your power. And uh, you don't need to be afraid of adding categories and having only one patient in one of the categories. So the ordinal analysis, just like the Wilcoxon ordinal analysis, uh, is gonna make use of all the data and it doesn't need you to have lots of ties in any one category. And in fact, the most powerful analysis would be one that had as many levels as you have patients in the study and have no ties uh, whatsoever. So the proportional odds model, um, is, um, is a really great choice for analyzing data like this. And uh, our department at Vanderbilt kind of specializes in research about this, and we've got graduate students that are doing a lot of good work on it. Uh, Nathan James in our department is looking heavily at the Bayesian proportional odds model. Um, and then, um, then you need your covariate adjustment, and so, um, and just remember, covert adjustment has absolutely nothing to do with balance of the treatment arms, but it has to do with explaining explainable outcome variation to gain precision and power. So uh, our plan is currently calling for uh, adjusting for the SOFA score, age, not assuming linearity, sex, the baseline level of the outcome scale that exists at baseline, levels two to five, time from symptom onset and days. And I, I think there's some discussion of adding race because there seems to be some race differences in prognosis. Um, now, what are you gonna do if you collect an ordinal outcome at more than one day? Well, there's lots of ways to deal with it. One of the more popular is a hierarchical model, which is a mixed effects model where you have um, uh, random effects for subjects. So you have clustered data and then there's other variations on that. And then there's a whole line of research that Jonathan Schilkraut uh, 
and others are intensively looking at, which involves state transition models and marginal models. Marginal models seem to have some advantages in terms of being probably more realistic in handling the longitudinal nature of the data without having to have random effects. And it's actually more robust. So we're actively looking at that as well as state transition models with an absorbing state. And um, we're doing a lot of research related to repeated ordinal outcomes with uh, uh, absorbing states. Uh, now, if you do measure an ordinal outcome at more than one day, uh, you have to figure out how to state your efficacy evidential parameter, and you have some typical choices. Uh, so if you're going to put uh, treatment and a treatment by time interaction in the model, um, and if you model this with a total of three degrees of freedom, let's say time is modeled quadratically. So you have two time effects and you have a treatment effect for three. Uh, the question you're addressing is, does the treatment have an effect at any time? Let's say your study goes from day one to day 28. Uh, does the treatment has, have, a, have a benefit at any time? Um, often the last time is the one of most interest. So you could say, what is the treatment minus control? This would be like a log odds ratio in the proportional odds model. Um, that, that is nicely summarized with only one degree of freedom. Uh, you see, so you don't have to diffuse it into three like this one has, but it adds, answers a narrow question. Does the treatment have an effect at the time L? L is our last day of follow-up. Or you could have the treatment minus control effect averaged over time zero to time L. Does treatment have an effect on the average? So it's important just to think about what you might focus on uh, because this will have a fair amount to do with the Bayesian power. Um, and uh, it's important and also whether you allow for uh, interaction with time. And I do want to mention one of our er areas of active research is the partial proportional odds model. And uh, that's being implemented now with uh, Ben Goodrich's help in the RMS package and R allowing for random effects uh, for longitudinal data and the partial proportional odds model uh, relaxes the proportional odds assumption for selected covariates. The, the covariate that most needs that relaxation is time. So when you're looking at an ordinal scale measured over time, um, you need to realize that there's different mixes of events happening at different times. You might have acute respiratory distress occurring at a certain uh, sequence of days. Death might be occurring later. And so the mix of events can change over time within your ordinal scale, and that creates a need for a partial proportional odds model. Uh, so we've, we've got a lot of development on that in our department. Um, and then there's the prior distribution. What are you going to specify uh, well, without having uh, the prior data that you might need, and of course, sometimes we don't trust prior data anyway, uh, we often use skeptical priors. So uh, a skeptical prior uh, stated in one way would say equal chance of harm as benefit. So we have these probabilities. And we might say that the, the treatments are known not to be cures. So the probability that the odds ratio is very large or that the treatment really kills people, uh, that probability can be assumed to be very small. So the probability of a doubling or a halving in the odds ratio might be taken as 0.025, uh, and you can solve for the standard deviation of the log odds ratio to get a prior that, that matches these requirements. Um, and then uh, there's a lot of material here that I'm not going to go through in uh, a lot of detail uh, but there's many ways of looking at operating characteristics. And hopefully, if you look at some of the R code here, it will give you some code that you can use as a starting point to vary, uh, to vary the setup of the trial that you might be designing and also to, to simulate under different situations. So this, the simulations vary a lot of different things. One is the, uh, the maximum sample size is fixed at 500, so that's not varied. But the data looks start at patient number 20, uh, 
And then we could look, if you wanted to, after every patient all the way up to 500. And then the odds ratios are set at the true unknown odds ratios. So we're conditioning on an odds ratio in calculating certain operating characteristics because the odds ratios are unknown, and but the unknown values that generate our data will be set to 0 0.8, 0 0.801, 0 0.802, all the way to 2.5, which would be extreme efficacy. The reason we're setting that to vary over such a fine grid is that we're only running one clinical trial at each odds ratio, and this greatly speeds up your computation time because then you can borrow information across these odds ratios to calculate your complete Bayesian power curve. Uh, the simulation uh, executes five types of evidence triggers or possible reasons for stopping a study. Uh, we're using these different prior distributions for the uh, treatment odds ratio. Um, and we're not doing any covert adjustment, uh, so the Bayesian power is going to be somewhat underestimated. And so there's a lot of ways to display the operating characteristics. And this is one of the simplest ones is just to say, if you were trying to get a high posterior probability of, of say efficacy, um, and you were calculating the probability of efficacy as you progress and, and make, make uh, continued looks later up to the 500th, you're going to have a reduction in the posterior probability if you're very skeptical. So this prior puts this tail area at a very skeptical low amount. So you're going to have a, say, a 0.05 or a 0.1 reduction in the posterior probability of efficacy in the early looks, and then that reduction is going to wear off. And this is a reduction compared to using a flat prior that has no uh, really doesn't have that kind of skepticism in it. If your prior is flatter, uh, the amount of penalty that you have by making your posterior probability smaller, you can see that that, that is a smaller reduction in the posterior probability. So that's just an easy way to look at skepticism. And you have all these other ways. So this would be uh, how much earlier would you have detected the evidence that you need uh, if you used a uh, less skeptical prior compared to using a more skeptical prior. So you can see that uh, if you used a very skeptical prior and your true odds ratio was, uh, was in here, uh, your, your lag might have been 75 uh, patients. You might lag behind declaring efficacy by 75 patients uh, if you used a very skeptical prior versus not. Whereas if you used a only the tiniest bit of skepticism, you know, you're going to make your lag of declaring victory uh, more like five, five looks at the data instead of 70 something looks at the data. So that's just one other way. And we, we have several other ways. So what's the uh, probability of hitting a trigger event, such as a posterior probability of efficacy greater than 0.95 here? What's the probability of hitting that trigger and calling success? as a function of the skepticism and as a function of the uh, how far along you are, what data look you're currently at. Uh, you can see that the probability of declaring similarity uh, is going to happen only if the true odds ratio is fairly close to one. So I would encourage you to look at this in all these different ways and see what appeals to you. This is the cumulative probability of stopping as you go on and accumulate more looks. Uh, so stopping for similarity when the two odds ratio is one and you have a flat prior, which is probably what I would use for a similarity assessment here. Uh, you see that really is really low until you get past the 300th data look. Uh, the probability of uh, efficacy when the true odds ratio is 1.75 and you use a skeptical prior uh, you know, you don't have a really high chance of finding efficacy with a true odds ratio of 1.75 until you get past around the 250th uh, patient accrued into the trial. Um, yet another way, what's the mean stopping time? And so the mean stopping time is estimated by just executing these triggers in these lots of simulations and then a study that wasn't stopped is sent right censored at 500 looks. 
and a study that was stopped, it, it, you have the look number that it was stopped at, and you just fit a survival model to that with right censoring and estimate the median stopping time. So uh, you can see there's a lot of ways to do it. And then how would you report the results when you get your, your answer? Well, we would report an odds ratio, but you can also uh, convert the odds ratio to probabilities. And I think this is one of the more clinically intuitive ways to state the results of a proportional odds model. So you can say, uh, what's the probability of being alive at all if you had the new drug versus the control? What's the probability, probability of being alive and not needing invasive ventilation under both? And go all the way down. And so we're really talking about cumulative probabilities. And you'd also could do this for cell probabilities. Uh, although they're a little bit harder to interpret when you have a competing uh, death event. So that is the big document that I wanted to talk about. And before we turn it over for discussion, I just wanted to see, just show you very briefly a couple of the other uh, bits of uh, uh, resources. So this is my second most popular um, blog article. It really gives uh, my... Uh, evolution from uh, frequentist to Bayesian statistics, and it has a lot of quotes in here to try to uh, motivate. Um, and I think one of my, uh, one of my favorite quotes that, that I came up with was this one. Uh, the only way to make frequentist methods comprehensible is to lie about them, and the only way to be fully accurate is to make them comprehensible. I think uh, you can do really good science with frequentist methods, but the actual interpretation, I think, is, is much harder. So there's a lot of story here. And um, one of the stories in this article is, is what got Don Berry to be a Bayesian. He, he spent years trying to teach smart graduate students how to interpret a confidence interval, and they could never, ever get it right. He finally said, well, the, the paradigm has to have a problem, and I'm going to switch paradigms. Uh, this is one of our discussions about the modeling issues. Uh, so you'll see a lot of stuff from David Schoenfeld uh, at Harvard and um, Mike Daniels at Florida, Jonathan Schilkraut, Ben Goodrich, and others. And so there's a lot of discussion about state transition ordinal models. Uh, there's discussions about handling pre-randomization ordinal state, other modeling issues. Um, and so a um, a really big um, point to make here, if you haven't stopped to really contemplate what's happening around us, is the opportunities for collaboration when there is an emergency have been incredible and the collaborative spirit has been, has totally blown me away. So we are getting uh, years of research done in a matter of weeks. Uh, and it really takes a lot of talented people working on these tough problems uh, to really make that kind of progress. And I really uh, have been amazed uh, what a little pressure and stress, uh, but an opportunity to serve really what it brings out in people. And uh, the, the development has happened so fast that um, all of our emails, uh, I just cannot even keep up with the knowledge acquisition that we've collectively gained. So I've had to start creating markdown files to start uh, curating my emails. And I've done that for a variety of discussions, um, uh, including this is one of our longest ones. So if I don't curate the discussions, I think our, our rationales are gonna be lost forever and I'll keep, I'll keep getting confused and forgetting what I've learned. So I've tried to become a little bit of a curator and I recommend that to anyone who's involved in a fast developing situation. Um, and so I'm going to stop there. And I know we have um, a lot of people in, I think we have 220 people online now, but uh, if you want to ask a question or especially start with maybe points of clarification, uh, please unmute yourself. And also if you wouldn't mind uh, turning on your webcam, uh, don't you don't have to, but it it would be nice if you could. So I'll stop there. <laughs>
I forgot. Sorry, I forgot to unmute, unmute everybody. I think in the group was too quiet. I've got I've got everybody right. muted now. So if you're, two if you're not if you're not asking a question or making a point, please oh, yeah. mute your microphone. Hi. Hi, Dr. Singer. May I ask a question? Absolutely. So um, <coughs> I've seen superficially some Bayesian design before with rare disease trials. But now I'm in the seat of thinking about for a COVID-19 trial, how to incorporate this. So my question really has to do with how does a study team for a Bayesian design trial look different from a study team for a more conventional randomized clinical trial? Fantastic question. And so um, I think there's, there's multiple types of trials. So there are... Uh, and, and if you're not talking, please mute your uh, microphone. Um, there are standard parallel group designs that are just. Oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, please mute your microphone. Uh, there's standard trials that have just a planned uh, terminal sample size. Once you're done with that, then I'm going to come in. I'm going to have to mute. Uh, okay. So how should I, I guess I'm just confused because I'm looking at the account. Um, okay. So I. Okay. I, I've had to mute everybody because somebody's not listening. Um, you, you have uh, three types of trials. You have your regular parallel group trial with a fixed sample size. You have highly sequential trials and you have adaptive trials or, or you have actually another type which is platform trials. A lot of platform trials are being launched now. Those have a lot of promise. They're really harder to manage and you need coordinated DSMBs and a lot of other things. Uh, for the type of trial I'm talking about, it's actually very simple uh, to do a highly sequential trial. It doesn't take any change of philosophy. It just It's just more work in terms of getting the data flow come more often and the DSMB might meet more often. Um, but, but there's nothing fundamental about that, fundamentally different. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how the unmute works at this point. Do I need to unmute everyone again, or can you unmute each yourself individually? Hello, Somebody? hello, Frank. Yes. This is Turkey. First of all, thank you for your sharing of knowledge. It's, it's a pleasure to, to attend this lecture. I have a question. You have proposed to use Bayesian methods in, in nearly all of study designs like superiority, non-inferiority, and equivalence. Um, I wanted to ask that sometimes we need an interim analysis, especially for anti-cancer. So can we like utilize Bayesian approach to, get, to gain more knowledge about early efficacy uh, of anti-cancer. Sorry, it's, it's, it's not related to COVID-19, but I think it's an interesting approach. Yeah, I, I don't think I can give a really smart answer to that. I would just say that uh, Bayesian methods in general are going to excel at interim analysis because the forward probabilities that you're calculating are just very applicable to the decisions that need to be made in the interim analysis. And also, if you want to use Bayesian uh, posterior predictive distributions, which we did not talk about, those can actually make predictions about what will happen with the success of the trial if you did go to the planned sample size. And so there's another mode of, of Bayesian prediction using what's called predictive distributions uh, to envision various things that might happen as you accrue more patients. But I'm talking now about just uh, what is the current picture? What's our level of evidence now using a plain posterior distribution? I think it's really ideal for interim analysis because it clears up a lot of confusion about multiplicity. And just for an example, if you're doing a group sequential trial, which is a very classical uh, frequentist approach to handling interim analysis, you can control the type one error with that if the intentions to analyze are fully specified, but not otherwise. Uh, 
and even when you control the type win error, you can't you cannot actually compute a p value uh, once you get into the sequential look uh, like you can with a fixed sample size. So there's a lot of ramification to Bayes, I think. Oh, hi, uh, can you hear me? I have a question. Please. Yes, uh, thanks for, for organizing this workshop. So uh, actually, uh, I have a question for the COVID-19. And uh, uh, so current uh, the trials is basically the endpoints is continuous or all the time to recover these kind of things or binary even uh, for many ongoing or finished trials. So you mentioned about uh, using the ordinal categorical endpoints. So why uh, currently no uh, the trials uh, still take this kind of endpoints or something I just uh, didn't notice that? I think uh, there's, there's a link in the main web page um, where, um, and this web page, there's a link at the bottom to a clinical trial tracker um, that um, is pretty neat that tells you about all the known clinical trials going on with COVID-19. Uh, this is from uh, Cytel and the Gates Foundation. And I think you'll find that there are many trials going on using this ordinal endpoint. There are not probably many using as a, as a longitudinal ordinal, but as a single day ordinal, I think it's more common uh, than you think. And so this is a place where the proportional odds model has been fairly widely accepted as a, as a great tool in, uh, for this kind of outcome. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I noticed that many is just uh, still follow the categorical endpoints and, uh, and the many is just uh, dichotomized to some binary endpoints to, to follow. We're seeing a lot of trials are dichotomizing and that is really even an ethical issue because you have to randomize a lot more patients if you're gonna dichotomize the endpoint. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Sure. Hi, Dr. Harrell. Hi. Thank you. Can I have a, a question for uh, the proportional odds uh, model? Sure. Actually, we are, we are doing the COVID uh, RCT here in NYU. Right. Um, my question is that we need to adjust uh, the covariate, several covariates in the proportional odds um, model um, with small sample size. So do you have the problem of this stability of this reliability of the model proportional odds model um, in small sample size? Of course, the, when the sample size is very small, we have a problem that is very hard to overcome, which is you don't have enough sample size to check the assumptions of the model. So the, in the future, as we get more mature and there's more Bayesian software, what you're going to see, uh, and we'll be able to do this to some extent next week with the partial proportional odds model, is having a Bayesian prior for the non-proportional odds part and to allow it to relax the assumptions, but the prior would be skeptical because otherwise your sample size would not be big enough. But as the sample size gets bigger, it would relax the proportional odds assumption more and more. So that to me is a fully rational approach. For now, the simplest way is if you look at uh, what's showing here with our proposed covert adjustment, uh, you might uh, with a smaller trial, um, uh, so our trial could be up to like 400 or 500 patients. Um, you might say, well, let's, let's uh, make age be linear. Let's don't have the sex variable in there because we may not believe it's so important. And we'll maybe, uh, we'll maybe cut out uh, another variable. So sometimes the sample size in the traditional modeling setup makes us need to use fewer covariates in the adjustment than we would use with a big sample. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so another question, uh, if I may. Um, for the priors, um, I, I read um, the, the paper, famous paper from uh, David Spiegelhalter many years ago about uh, prior selections for 
RCTs in Bayesian. Um, so he talked about uh, uh, doing the importance of doing the sensitivity analysis uh, using different uh, type of priors. So uh, here uh, you covered, uh, I, I see that your material, there are skeptical priors and um, how do you relate this with the, with the David Spiegelhalter's um, pessimistic prior and enthusiastic prior? Yes, uh, so uh, I'm a huge uh, disciple of David Spiegelhalter and he's the one that really converted me to Bayesianism. And um, he uses what he calls a community of priors. And so you might have a skeptical prior against efficacy if you're trying to show efficacy. You might have a favorable prior for efficacy if you're trying to show inefficacy. You okay. might have a prior that's uh, away from the null if you're trying to show similarity. So he, he likes to take the philosophy that some of the people that are reviewing your work are skeptics and the way that you can, the way that you convert a skeptic is that you use something that is uh, skeptical against what you would like to show. So that's, that's one of his central philosophies and I've always found that to be very appealing. And I think what is a little bit harder than those choices is if you want to use a skeptical prior, just how skeptical does it need to be? Uh, it, he recommended uh, using expert, uh, the knowledge from the ex, expert area. I think, I think he doesn't recommend that in the, in the general way of thinking. My, t my reading of his work is that he spent a lot of time getting expert opinion from oncologists in cancer trials. And they, okay. were, they were uniformly over-optimistic about the latest chemotherapy. He said it was, it was pretty bad. But what he learned was that the, dis the disagreement between the experts was more valuable uh, than what they agreed upon. And so he used the expert uh, opinion to create the variance of the prior distribution, and he completely ignored where they put the mean. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Could, could you? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, this is Fraser Smith from FDA. I had, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, um, they typically prefer to use something more um, basic like CMH tests with modified RIDIT scores for analyzing ordinal data uh, rather than more, mod more sophisticated or complicated modeling procedures. Do you have an um, uh, opinion about something like the modified RIDIT scores CMH versus portion of odds assumptions? I've got an opinion, Fraser, you may not like on that. So the, the main paper that developed the proportional odds model was Walker and Duncan in 1967. And as of 1967, the Cochrane mantel hensel method for this was completely obsolete. It's just not competitive and it's not as general and it doesn't, it doesn't generalize to longitudinal data. It doesn't handle ties very well. Uh, so you call the proportionalized model uh, complicated. I call it elegant and easily interpretable. So we may have to disagree on that. And what, who's the author of this paper again? Uh, Walker and Duncan, 1967, Biometrica. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sean O'Brien uh, asked a question on the chat line about uh, the relaxing the proportional odds assumption and specifying a prior for the non-proportional odds. So the way I envision doing that is it's, it's like the prior we used here for the treatment effect. It's just a, it's a skeptical prior on the differential effect uh, for the non-proportional odds part of the model. So it's still a normal distribution with a mean of zero. Uh, and then the variance might be uh, fairly small to penalize the model towards proportional odds. Other question? Dr. Harrell, can I ask, ask a question? Yes. 
Hi, uh, thank you for the lecture. It's been really nice. Uh, I am very interested in modeling continuous outcomes with ordinal models. And I've seen Nathan James' work uh, recently, and he mentions uh, the issue with choosing K, the number of outcomes, in a more Bayesian way. I'm just wondering if we have any advances and if you have any thoughts on uh, doing this, he mentions Dirichlet lit process priors on K. And yeah, it's really, um, and, and all that I know about this, I've learned from Nathan. And so um, what we don't want to use Bayes to specify the number of categories. So we want, to, we want the number of categories to be the number of observed categories. Um, and which is a little bit strange uh, in terms of what we usually do with model specifications, but it's more like every time you compute the empirical cumulative distribution function, you have a step in the function every time there's a unique data value, distinct data value, it's sort of like that. The problem that Nathan has worked on a lot is there is a issue that hasn't been solved fully yet of what prior distribution to use for the intercepts. So we want the number of intercepts to be possibly very, very large. Uh, and in the frequentist world, you know, the software I have in R, it'll allow for six or 8,000 distinct values of Y with no problem at all. Uh, we would like to be able to do that with base so you, you can fully use the proportionalized model for continuous data, um, just like we use the Cox model with continuous survival data. It's also a semi-parametric model. But we haven't fully solved the problem of the specification of the prior such that everything behaves as the number of categories of Y grows. So that's still, still some work to be done there. Nice, thank you very much. Can I ask one more question, please? Sure. Uh, you recently uh, introduced a new function in your RMS package for allowing uh, ordinal models in a Bayesian fashion. I was just wondering what are the main differences between your function and, you know, working out the model using something like BRMS, please. Yeah, the main difference is you have prior distributions, which for now it's just implementing normal distributions and you can specify um, standard deviations for those. And the other difference is it has to be really smart about collinearity because Bayesian posterior sampling gets bogged down with collinearity. So you have to use a QR decomposition within the Bayesian uh, uh, computation. Uh, and then the other difference is it's very, very easy. This is an amazing thing about Bayes. If you have a model for univariate data and you want it to handle uh, longitudinal data using random effects, adding random effects to a Bayesian model is far, far easier than adding random effects to a frequentist model. So now the, uh, my function handles uh, random effects within the proportional odds model. There's, there's other stuff out there that will do that and um, but I have some slight advantages, I think, in the way I'm implementing that. Cool. Thank you very much, Professor. I did want to mention, somebody mentioned earlier doing sensitivity analysis to various priors. I am a weird person in that I, I don't like sensitivity analysis in general. Uh, in a lot of situations, I want things to be sensitive to the assumptions that I make. Um, and I really don't want to give a series of answers to a question when the audience is not set up for that. Because what happens with the sensitivity analysis is there will be people in the audience that don't like the treatment that the study is studying. And they'll pick on one of the results of the sensitivity analysis to try to pick apart your whole study. They'll do cherry picking. So I have some reservations about sensitivity analysis and don't want to do too many of them. Hi, Dr. Harrell. This is Hi. Ying again. Thank you. Hi, Dr. You Harrell. Just, you, you just answered the, the, the question that I want to ask again <laughs> about the sensitivity analysis. Thank you. And, sure. But um, uh, the, the reason why of this sensitivity analysis, I feel the, because it's uh, the Bayesian uh, using this to 
address the critic criticism from frequentists that they say that uh, Bayesian rely on the prior that we use. Uh, so that's why we need to do the sensitivity analysis to show the spectrum of the estimates based on different uh, prior. So if, you, if we don't do sensitivity analysis, how do we address the critic, criticism from frequentists about this? I, I, the way I would answer it is more by this quote that's showing on the screen. Um, it, it's time for Bayesians to demand of frequentists what frequentists demand of Bayesians and not be timid. And so what happens when you're using uh, no hypothesis significance testing to make decisions is you're at no point calculating the probability that you're correct uh, in making a certain decision. Uh, and you're having to translate indirect evidence uh, to an action. It's very much akin to knowing the sensitivity and specificity of a test, whereas what you need is the probability the patient has the disease. And so uh, I would kick back to say that no hypothesis testing is simple because it kicks down the road, the gymnastics needed to subjectively, and it's highly subjectively, convert observations about data to evidence about parameters. So I would turn the whole thing around. And then I do need to say that if you're going to make decisions, you need to play the odds and you need to have the right probability inputs to the decision. There is simply no mathematical way to get the probabilities you need without having a starting point. So the prior distribution is the cost of having actionable probabilities at the end. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So in this way, I actually, uh, as an analyst, as a biostatistician, we do think the good practice for us is still doing um, uh, several estimates based on several kinds of priors. But we, we need to be careful when we interpret the present the results to the audience. I'm not, so? I'm not sure as an analyst that that is best practice to try different priors. But what you really need, um, and I tell you one of the best examples of that, FDA has some wonderful work going on with regard to pediatric clinical trials and how to, how to smartly borrow information from adults. And uh, the FDA statisticians did uh, an actual elicitation of, pediatric, of uh, pediatric experts, especially in pharmacology, to, to elicit from them the probability that the adult data are applicable to kids. That, that's telling you how much borrowing you want to do from the adults into the kids. I think that's an example of eliciting what we need to know. And if it was a simple situation where it was all adults, trying to find out from expert opinion what sort of treatment effects are impossible is the first thing you need to do so that you rule out impossible values. This is not a cure. The odds ratio is not gonna be infinite. It's not gonna be even be a five. It's not gonna even be a two or a half. Uh, so ruling out impossible results uh, and then trying to find out what is a tail of the prior such that beyond that efficacy, you're very unlikely to see it because of that class of drugs or other information we have. I don't want to trust an optimistic prior uh, that I get from experts in general, but I do want to trust uh, their knowledge about what sort of extreme treatment effects are very, very unlikely. I want to factor that in and not necessarily do a whole lot of sensitivity analysis. Thank you very much. Thank sure. you. Sure. Any, any other questions? Any, anybody who hasn't asked a question? I was just wondering, I had a quick question about um, the proportional odds assumption um, and whether uh, how you actually test it. 
and whether it's important to test? I should for the graduation. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a very important question because it's an assumption that's violated very commonly. Uh, but, but the context is not really remembered. The context is we do things all the time where the assumptions are violated. Uh, we are still doing a t-test assuming equal variances, and I don't know why that's still standard practice. Uh, we're doing t-tests assuming a normal distribution. The Bayesian t-test does not assume a normal distribution, but it gives you a probability of normality when you're finished. Uh, so we need models that really take into account departures, but if, if you're worried about the proportional odds model, you have to ask the question, what are you going to do if you think the proportional odds model is not good enough. About three times out of four, when I ask somebody what they're going to do instead, they give me an answer that's decidedly worse than the proportional odds model. So uh, one of the worst things you can do is to treat the outcome as totally categorical, uh, you know, polynomials or multinomial. So it's all relative. And the way that I teach uh, model building to students is, is you never have to be perfect. You just don't want to build a model that somebody can beat in 24 hours. I, ha I had a question um, in regards to the criteria set for success, failure, or futility. Um, and for me, this seems completely reasonable but my concern is with the hard, hard core sort of stopping rule, because there is, you're saying, well, if P1 is greater than 0.95, then we stop. Uh, how do we communicate that we don't actually care if it's 0.94 or 0.95 or 0.96? So we're looking at sort of a, a soft rule rather than a hard rule in my mind. That, that's a great question, and I would love to have the perfect language that gets that point across. I was dealing with that uh, just recently. And um, I think, you know, any threshold is ultimately uh, defeating the purpose. I, I think of these thresholds as examples that help the smart people who are reviewing the trial have the right discussion. Uh, I would like to go further than that and try to not give them a bias in favor of a certain threshold. So that's, that's why I think your question is so important. And in the heat of battle, what people need to be able to do is to say, the evidence for efficacy uh, is really, it's only 0.96. And we've uncovered this new adverse event uh, of uh, people having uh, bleeding or they're having, uh, you know, some other bad side effect. And so we're, we're not even impressed with that 0.96 because this side effect now is worse than we thought. So that's just an example where you really do trade-offs in every decision you make. And the more you adhere to a threshold, the less good you are at making trade-offs. That, that's great. Thank you. And the, I, I read through this and the wording you have put in was more like saying these are targets rather than hard and fast rules. Is, is, do you think that's a language that is acceptable to many, just communicating it as a target rather than a rule? I would like to know the answer to that by actually polling uh, clinical reviewers. And uh, if you get experienced in this, you have to give me some feedback. Uh, I, to me, it's a reasonable word, but it hasn't been field tested. It just, to me, it gets the right idea across. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, Sean O'Brien was asking about uh, software for the uh, partial proportional odds model where you're relaxing the, uh, the covariate uh, effects, uh, you're relaxing the proportional odds assumptions. So there's two, uh, two nice approaches to that. One is in the frequentist world, there is an R package called VGAM, V-G-A-M, that's incredibly flexible and it handles the uh, partial proportional odds model with all sort of customized restrictions. And then I'm implementing a piece of that in the BLRM uh, function in the RMS package that will hopefully be ready in about a week. Uh, 
to have the Bayesian partial proportional odds model. So this is essentially like having a time-dependent covariate in a Cox model to relax the uh, proportional hazards assumption. Any uh, questions, comments, commentary, worries, suggestions? Do you have any thoughts on uh, handling missing data? We're doing longitudinal collection of, uh, of the WHO scale over time, and we have some I, missing data. I really have avoided that issue because <laughs> we've had so much else to deal with, but the issue has come up in some discussions. And of course, you need to, if you have a 28-day follow-up, you need to follow people after they're discharged from the hospital, and that presents some, some uh, logistical challenges. Uh, but what we hope is for the most part, the principle of assuming missing at random, uh, which allows you to do full likelihood approaches, unlike GEE. Uh, so you do full likelihood Bayesian or, uh, so that would be either a marginal or marginal structural model. That would be a random effects model, uh, mixed effects model. Um, with the missing at random assumption, you use all available data and you don't really have to get into imputation of the outcome uh, variable when you have, uh, when you have uh, basically missing at random assumption as I understand it, is it a patient who drops out, uh, they gave you a, an inkling that they were having trouble by their previous outcome measurements on previous days. Thanks. Sure. Hey, Frank, this, this is Sean. Hey, Sean. Uh, so, so I, I was having a little bit of stage fright deciding whether to make a comment or not, but I, I just wanted to make one comment that might uh, illustrate what I see as kind of a useful, an illustration of the usefulness of the Bayesian perspective in this context. And that relates to the recent study of remdesivir from China that was reported in the Lancet in the end of April. And they, uh, you know, had a conventional frequentist analysis, and they concluded that remdesivir was not associated with statistically significant clinical benefits. And based in part on on the material that you had put together, the really incredible resources, um, I, I decided to look at their 14-day WHO endpoint in a Bayesian proportional odds model framework. And when you calculated the posterior probability of a, a benefit, you know, in terms of an odds ratio uh, greater than one, where in, in their case, uh, greater than one meant benefit, um, using a flat pot prior, the posterior probability was of benefit, of any benefit was 82%, hmm. and with a slightly more conservative prior was 77%. And to me, that gives a really different flavor or take home message or, or you know, a, a, uh, I just can causes me to think about the results a little bit differently because they, the, the results of the study were really presented as a counterpoint against um, when Anthony Fauci had kind of reported apparently promising results from the U.S. study. This was a counterpoint, and I, and I think maybe without interpretation, you can think of the studies being more consistent than they, than they appeared. I'm really glad you brought that up. And, you know, on our uh, discussion board, datamethods.org, there is a topic devoted to Bayesian reanalysis of published clinical trials. And someone created an R Shiny app that, that is really cool that's discussed on that page uh, where you plug in estimates that are published and you get a very reasonable Bayesian analysis. You specify the prior. Uh, I, I think that kind of work is especially needed when the authors have misinterpreted a large p-value. And we're seeing this all over the place. And, and because of that, and because the New England Journal doesn't have any standards about this, uh, try, uh, uh, drugs that are maybe promising are dropped. They're dropped early. And uh, I, I, think that's, I think that's a real problem. So I'm glad you brought it up, Sean. There's another issue that's really important is um, like in the, the 
the Gilead drug that made the big uh, headlines a week or so ago with Gilead and with NIH, you know, they changed their endpoint uh, to uh, time until ordinal scale changed by two levels endpoint, which has a lot of statistical problems and, and it has lower power. It may be clinically interpretable, but they may have gotten lucky because it's a lower power outcome uh, measure. And I think we need to think really hard about uh, what outcomes we really need to recommend. And uh, if you think about the ordinal longitudinal outcome, it, it subsumes all of these other ways of stating the outcome. It's going to have superior power and it can be translated into an expected time until a certain condition is met. Uh, so it gives you the best of all worlds, but it, it is harder to explain to people. Hello, Frank. Yes. Um, given that you mentioned the, the FDA trial and changing of, of the endpoint, so I work as a clinical reviewer. The study didn't be uh, a solid for me, like changing the endpoint. If you kept changing your endpoint, you will have a statistically significant result, like by chance, um, because you are trying different endpoints until you succeed, either, even if it is, if it is specified in, in your protocol. But do you think that this is a proper way to analyze your data? Isn't that like you are just looking for a significant result without, without thinking that this result will, will mean a clinically meaningful and with, with a solid statistical analysis? I think another great question, and I think what, if you're going to accept a study where the endpoint was changed in midstream, the only way to accept that is to have faith that the investigators remain blinded, and the statisticians especially remain blinded while they're learning things. In other words, you can learn about time patterns without having treatment in the data set. Uh, I don't know exactly how this one was done and, and, you know, who had access to what bit of information, but if you, if you can rely on proper blinding, there are things it's okay to learn as the trial progresses. It still raises a little bit of a doubt in, in people's minds. People don't like to have changes after, uh, after the data start flowing, uh, especially if there's any chance of unblinding. But I just don't know enough about this one study to know how it happened. But I, I also wonder um, if, you're, if you have a time effect on the treatment and you say you're going to learn from the data how to treat time and how to treat which measurements you're going to focus on over the multiple days in the hospital, exactly how do you do that? What criteria do you use to quantify the effect of treatment over time? Um, to make to allow you to make a reliable decision about how to refine the endpoint even when you're completely uh, blinded. I just don't know what the criteria are uh, other than one of the things they looked at is if you have a 14-day endpoint and just you don't see events happening before 14 days, you know, that would be kind of clear that that might be a decent criterion for um, having a later assessment being focused upon. Uh, another point, uh, imagining that you will start with, with the most clinically meaningful endpoint for you and you tested that and there's no, no superiority of your drug on this specific endpoint, you will go lower, lower, lower to, to list relevant uh, clinical endpoints and you're going to succeed. Let's say you're going to succeed. But as, as I understand, these endpoints are usually used as a surrogate endpoint and not an endpoint that you rely on. So you need further testing to, to confirm the efficacy. But if you, if you failed in the first place in your um, primary endpoint that you, you were specifying and you, you thought that it would be the most clinically meaningful, does, does succeeding and, and a surrogate endpoint like day 14 or any arbitrary um, interval, like do the two groups differ in day 15, day 16, whatever, but it is not a mortality or, or, or these outcomes. 
does this uh, like justify your data? Does this give you a reliable data going from the most most clinically meaningful endpoints to lower ones? While I I would thought that they calculated their sample size, for example, based on on something higher. Um, I think it's a difficult question, and I just have two things for you to consider. The first is, if you involve patients and practicing physicians in developing a scale that reflects what is important to patients, you know, you, you do want to avoid needing a ventilator. You, you want to avoid uh, acute respiratory distress. You want to avoid dying. And if you have a reasonable way to summarize how bad each outcome is through an ordinal scale or a full patient utility analysis, I think that should supersede all the other things that you just mentioned. Uh, and, and it really captures uh, a big part of the clinical picture in terms of what's important to the patient. This is one reason I like ordinal scales. And the other reason I like them is you don't have to do anything with competing risk analysis. So death will override any of the other events and it's part of the scale itself. So I don't like this idea of looking at a whole lot of separate outcomes, but if you really need to separate the outcomes, uh, there, is, there are many Bayesian options that will put them back together in a sensible way. So one would be, you've got 10 different outcomes you have 10 opportunities for a drug to show benefit. Uh, and you calculate the Bayesian probability that the drug benefits at least seven out of 10 or six out of 10. So let's say we want the probability that the drug benefits the patients on the majority of 10 endpoints. And you show a high posterior probability of hitting at least six out of 10 endpoints in the right direction. That is a way to deal with multiple endpoints in a rational fashion that also takes into account that you've made the task a bit too easy. So we're gonna make it hard again by requiring majority benefit of the endpoint. So BASE gives you options that you would never think of in the frequentist world. Hey Frank. Thank you just, very much. Just a quick comment, historical comment uh, that links into several of the other uh, remarks that you've made. Um, around the time that you were getting started, um, there was an article in the New England Journal um, by Keebler Smith and I think somebody else, perhaps Keebler Smith and Chalmers, that uh, exposed the New England Journal as having published many um, clinical trials with less than 50% power against, uh, or less than 25% power against 50% reductions in mortality and other primary endpoints. Um, and that really galvanized the movement to, um, bring power analysis into NIH funded studies with clinical trials in particular emphasized. Um, so it's mind boggling that uh, 35 years later, um, we still have an issue of the New England Journal not knowing how or not with all the great editorial stat statistical advice that the New England Journal uh, commands of not being able to uh, uh, implement rational interpretation of, uh, of, of quote unquote, negative, non-significant uh, uh, clinical trial data. Peter, it's fantastic to see you. Um, I think another example of just show how bad things can get, I, th I think you made some great points, is if you look at the debacle around non-inferiority studies, what you're seeing is journals and FDA allowing sponsors to say, that we're going to declare a drug non-inferiority, yes. non-inferior if it doesn't double your mortality. Yep. You're actually yep. seeing studies where the non-inferiority margin is a is a hazard yes. ratio of two. It's not killing people to the tune of doubling the mortality. When did this get allowed? And how did journals? I've been a reviewer on papers like this, and I've said this paper is rejected. I don't care if the study's finished or not. This paper had a design flaw, and I'm not going to accept a doubling of mortality is yeah. not meaningful to the patient. And the way I word it is, what if the drug had benefited mortality by lowering it by 30%? You're going to declare that uninteresting as an efficacy outcome, right? You're going to be consistent, right? No, they're not going to be. I've seen the same studies. Yes. <laughs> nuts. Just nuts. And then we still see papers published in every journal where the power calculation was a joke, uh, 
in that it was a uh, superiority study with an, a, an effect size of 60% reduction in something. Yeah, yeah. That's all being allowed. All Studies are still being launched on a hope and a prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Glad you brought this up. Yeah, we have to keep that battle up. Anybody else have any other comments? These have been great points you all are bringing up. Just Frank, can you, can you give us the example that Peter was talking about? The trials with, with, with this methodological problems and non inferiority. Do you have examples to look at? I've got too many examples, but I didn't write them down in one place. The most common example is not where the hazard ratio of two, but it's a hazard ratio of 1.5. Uh, not, not quite as extreme as I said, but I've seen so many of those and in published in good journals and they should have been rejected. And FDA should have never, ever allowed the sponsor, in my personal opinion, strictly personal, should have never allowed the sponsor to even remotely mention entertaining, contemplating a non-inferiority margin of, of raising mortality by 50%. So it, it would be usually on anti-cancer drugs, right? Well, I mean, you see this in all medical fields, I think. But I've seen this in cardiovascular, you see it in cancer. And part of it is uh, when you have a fixed sample size design and you cannot extend the study and, and you need the budget to be approved up front for the planned uh, sample size, you really are locked in. And Bayesian really invites you to be more flexible than that. You get to the end, it's really justifiable to randomize 30 or 40 more patients because you might actually be able to make a conclusion. And so uh, people, uh, they launch a study on a hope and a prayer. They do a regular power calculation. They come up with a sample size that's too low, uh, but they want to do the study anyway, and they have no ability to extend it. And do you know how many studies have been published with a p-value of 0.07 that uh, could have been resulting in a successful therapy option? There's probably a lot of studies. So, so you mentioned that the small sample size. I I went through some papers that they always, I, I felt that they always um, being so positive about their the difference of the effect. So before the study, they are imagining that their drug will have 60-70% reduction uh, or efficacy. Will, the, will this result in a, a lower sample size needed? And if they didn't achieve that difference by the end of the study, does this study mean anything? I'd, I'd love to hear Peter Emery's statement because he has studied ethics, research ethics, a lot more than I have. Peter, isn't there an ethical statement that can be made about whether it's legitimate to launch these nearly futile studies? Oh, Peter, I think Peter had to sign off. He sent me a message. Sorry. I bet he would have a good way to word it. I think, I think there's been a few papers written about the ethics of launching hopeless studies and getting patients excited when the patients are actually not going to contribute to knowledge. And I think the majority of people will tell you this is not ethical. It's not acceptable. It has a lot to do with academia versus pharma industry, because in pharma industry, there's certain things that pharma companies will not put up with in terms of design, whereas in academia, an individual researcher can often get approval to do a single, a single site study uh, that is not having much chance of success. It's part of academic freedom. So I think in some ways there's too much academic freedom. Just circling back for one second to the Bayesian approach, the main philosophy of Bayes is to, is to have a parameter for everything that you know that you don't know. And so if you're uncertain about something, instead of putting in an effect size, we want to detect a 50% improvement in something, we're going to have a prior 
and we're and our sample size calculation is going to reflect that the the effect might be much less than that or, or somewhat bigger than that and David Spiegelhalter and others have had some wonderful papers showing how to do rational sample size calculation that incorporates the uncertainties that we tend to pretend that we don't have in the frequentist world. Anybody have an opinion about any of those things or have any different question? Well, I think we'll wrap up. These have been fantastic questions. I really, really appreciate that. I appreciate everybody being on. And I would just encourage you to continue the discussion. We have a, um, a datamethods.org uh, topic around this document and, and related things. And there's a lot of great modeling discussion about ordinal outcomes in this particular topic on datamethods.org. And you can write, you can create new topics. Uh, and there's other, a lot of other topics related to Bayesian design and reanalysis of clinical trials. Uh, add to those topics, post questions there, and we can keep some of this great discussion going. So thank you everybody for being here and sticking with it and, uh, and being so stimulating with the great questions and comments and, and hope to see you again uh, sometime soon and be safe.